You're listening to the Online Marketing Made Easy Podcast, episode number 110. Welcome to the Online Marketing Made Easy Podcast. Business advice so easy, you'll feel like you're cheating. And now your host, Amy Porterfield. Welcome back to another episode of the Online Marketing Made Easy Podcast. Thank you so very much for tuning in. I am extra excited about today's episode because as I promised, we have an extra special returning guest, one of my dear, dear friends, Rick Mulready. Rick, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me back on here. I am excited about this because we promised about every six weeks we would do a Facebook Q&A session. I was a little nervous that when I called you again and said, are you (laughs) ready to do it again? You would say, are you kidding? I was just on the show because it feels like we just did this. I think we just did actually. I know, but I'm batching these days. So I'm kind of ahead well, of schedule. You are way farther ahead than I am on my show. <laughs> First time ever, I think that I've been ahead this much. Yes. So I'm really looking forward to diving into the six questions that we chose. And just to let you guys know how we choose questions, we go into my private Facebook groups. So I have a few courses, webinars that convert and list builders lab. And I go into those courses and I say, okay, guys, in the private Facebook groups, and I say, what kind of questions do you have? with Facebook ads. I'm going to get on my show with Rick Mulready. He's the expert of all experts when it comes to Facebook ads. So this is your opportunity. So these are real questions from my groups. And I think that you guys will find them really valuable as well. Awesome. Now, before we get into these, I have to ask you, didn't you just get back from Disney, Disney world? (laughs) I did. Didn't you guys just get back from there? Okay. Maybe we need to talk about this really fast. What were you thinking? It's spring break. (laughs) I know. So I told everyone a few episodes back that I was literally recording an episode and getting on a plane to go on this family trip. And I was really, really excited because I was going with my stepson, Cade and my husband, Hobie. It was our family trip. It was going to be great. Now I will say the trip was amazing because I got six days with my boys and I didn't work, which is kind of a big deal, right? The only thing I did is I jumped into my private Facebook groups that I promised I would be there daily. So I did do that every morning. But other than that, I didn't work. And we all had a great time together, except for the fact that no one told me Walt Disney World is an absolute zoo. Like the crowds were incredible. Have you ever gone there? I've been to Disneyland here in California, but never been to Disney World. Okay. So no one warned me that it was going to be that chaotic. Like everywhere we looked, people were bumping us with strollers and yelling at their kids. We were joking, Hobie and I, that we're pretty sure divorces happen at Walt Disney World (laughs) because the parents were yelling at each other. This poor guy, he was carrying his kid on his shoulders and his wife turns around and she says, you need to keep up with us. We've got two more days here. (laughs) We just started laughing like, whoa, this is a stressful trip. It wasn't that stressful for us because Cade's 13 years old old and he was right. easy to put in the lines and it, whatever. But every line was over an hour and a half, except when we had a fast pass. Oh. I know in oh. the sun beating down on us. Uh, no, thanks. But I will say my favorite part of the trip was the Harry Potter experience at Universal. Oh, okay. That was kind of amazing. We got the wands. We did all the magic tricks. I guess Cade wouldn't say they were magic tricks. They're spells. And we went on all the rides. So I did love that. We drank the butter beer. But now there's a universal Harry Potter in LA. So I do oh, highly really? recommend that you go to that, Rick. Okay. All right, cool. But stay away from Walt Disney World. <laughs> okay, we'll do. Check. The most stressful trip I've ever been on. But anyway, it was good to be with the boys. And next time we're going to Hawaii. Oh, there you go. That yeah. sounds better. <laughs> nice. More my speed. Yes. Okay. So thanks for asking. Let's yeah. go ahead and get into these questions. And I'm just going to go for it. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Question number one is from Denise and Denise says, if an ad works for you, do you use the same ad for different launches or do you create a duplicate of the ad for every launch you do? Such a great question to answer that very simply. Yeah, I would use it again. If it was working before I would use it again. Now, some things go into this too, like how much time has passed since you last, you know, during the last launch and, and, and all that stuff. If she's asking, I'm actually, I have the question right here. So I'm, I want to make sure that I'm understanding it correctly. Do you create a duplicate of the ad for every launch? Yes, I would do that. I would start new, I start a new campaign. But if that same ad, like, you know, the image, if it's an image ad, if it, you know, the, the image and the ad copy and everything worked well last time in the target audiences, 
I would duplicate that everything into a brand new campaign and start that bad boy in a new in a new campaign. So yep. the other way I guess she could have done it is if she paused it and then started it up again. Yes, yes. And that's kind of the, I was trying to figure out like how she was worrying that question. And would you advise against the whole pause and start it up again thing? Well, I don't necessarily advise against it. The only caution I would I would give to people is that a lot of people expect the exact same results that they were getting. So let, let's just say I'm running an ad for two weeks right now, getting really good results. Then I pause it because whatever, my promotion is over. And then, you know, maybe three weeks down the road, I'm going to do another promotion and I want to unpause that ad. Oftentimes what happens is people expect the same results because it's like, well, I haven't changed anything. All I did was pause the ad and restart it. Well, when you do that, you take the ad out of Facebook's algorithm, their mm. delivery algorithm, and that can throw off the results. Now, I'm not saying that the results at that point are going to necessarily be worse. Like, I mean, maybe they could be better at that point. But oftentimes I hear from people is that, you know what, Rick, I paused the ad. I just wasn't getting the same results as before. Why is that? Well, that's the reason. It's because you take the ad out of Facebook's delivery algorithm and that kind of throws things off. So now here's kind of a weird question and you tell me mm -hmm. if this even makes sense, but if I was running an ad right now and it was doing really, really well in, in all respects, and then I paused it and then I started it, let's say two months later and it wasn't doing so well, could one of the factors in relation to that whole algorithm thing be mm -hmm. that other people are targeting the same people and maybe they're spending more money on their ads or they're more yeah. aggressive Okay, so that plays a Absolutely. factor. Okay. Yeah, for yeah, because the the competition could be very different at that point and because, you know, Facebook ads as a whole in the algorithm it's a bidding system. So, yeah, if there's more competition in there, you know, the cost could be higher in order to reach that same audience and get the same type of results. So, Absolutely. I want to give a little love to the people right now that are feeling like sometimes they do things with their Facebook ads and they can't explain like, why can't they get the same results or why doesn't it look mm -hmm. the same as last time? And sometimes you need to be really nice to yourself and realize that you don't control everything and you could have set it up perfectly because I think as entrepreneurs, especially new entrepreneurs, we're quick to beat ourselves up. Like I messed up somewhere. Like I I'm a screw up. This mm -hmm. is all wrong. Yep. Or sometimes it could literally be the algorithm is kind of playing games with you because it's different than it was before or whatever. So I think we kind of need to be kind to ourselves sometimes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a, it's a mindset thing too. And just knowing that we all go through it. I mean, doing Facebook ads all the time and the same thing happens to me where I'm like, man, like this was working a little bit ago. Why isn't it doing it now? And it's just a mindset of, all right, you know what? I'm going to figure this out. We'll get to the bottom of this. Yes, exactly. Okay. So question number two is from Nikki and Nikki says, are conversions lower on weekends? Good question. And it really depends. And this is, this is kind of one of those ones that it really, it depends on what your niche is and the type of audience that you're trying to reach. Fridays and Saturdays tend to be the higher traffic days on Facebook, but I've seen kind of both. Like I've run campaigns where I've had higher conversions on the weekends and less during the week and then vice versa. I have, you know, all like students, all, all kinds of different things they're running kind of see the same thing where it's up and down, it's, it's up and down. So there's really, it's very, very dependent on what niche you're in and what your offer is and so forth. So I can't give a really, you know, a specific answer to that other than just to kind of watch, you know, watch the stats that you're getting for your campaigns and try to make some sense over if you're running campaigns for a while, you know, keep track of it, you know, and say, okay, you know what, I'm seeing higher conversions on the weekends or lower conversions on the weekends. So I'm going to maybe affect my budget. I'm going to change my budget accordingly to, you know, reflect where I'm getting those conversions, but kind of keep track of it. Kind of a longer answer to say, it really depends on what your niche is. Okay. So Nikki, the answer is not necessarily in terms of our conversions lower on weekends, but it's something that you really do need to take the time and track. So Rick, do you ever turn your ads off on the weekends and then turn them back on, let's say Monday morning? Is that something I, you've ever done? I don't simply don't because either. of what we were talking about in that first question with Denise is that when you do that, it, it takes you out of the algorithm. Mm. And that oftentimes has a negative effect on your ads. You know, like I said, sometimes it could improve the results, but oftentimes it has that negative effect. So I tend not to do that. Gotcha. Okay. Good lesson. All right. Number three is a good one. Dana says, I've heard that running ads in the three days before a webinar gets the best show up rate. But if you wanted to do this with Facebook ads, would you start the ad campaign a few days earlier to test and optimize the ads 
and then just ramp up the budget the last two or three days. So before we get into that question, Rick, explain a little bit about this whole ramp up. And and I know Mm -hmm. we do that with our ads and and why it's important. Yeah, I love this question because of this whole ramp up period. This is the kind of theme of this episode so far. This Q&A is kind of the algorithm that, that Facebook has running in the background. And you have to, once you start your ads, you kind of have to give Facebook's algorithm a little time to sort of do its thing, if you will. And that often takes, you know, two to three days just to kind of get your ads going. The biggest mistake that I see people make is that they start their ads. Let's just say they start them at, I don't know, seven or eight in the morning. And then by three o'clock in the afternoon, if they're not seeing great results by that point, they're like, holy cow, something's wrong. And they start messing with the ads. When in reality, like you really have to give it some time I don't like to make any kind of changes to the ads until at least 48 hours after I've started the ads. Because by that point, I've given it some time to get into the algorithm and see if that's going to see some results from it. And what we're talking about here, what Dana's asking here is that I obviously want to get the highest show up rate possible for my webinar. And if she's hearing that running ads three days prior to the webinar is going to get that best show up rate, does she just start her ads three days before and just with high budgets or does she give herself more ramp up time period? So meaning I'm going to start my ads maybe seven to eight days out from the webinar, start it with a small budget, kind of see what, you know, test to see what's working and what's not working. And then for those ones that are working, I'm going to start to scale. And I know you've talked about scaling on a previous episode, you know, start, start to scale my ads and then bring my ad spend up incrementally, which is going to try to keep that cost per lead sort of in check. Because what happens if you go from say like, $10 a day to $100 a day, your cost per lead is going to go way out of whack because you just flooded that target audience with such a larger spend. And so that's what we're talking about here. And so I do recommend starting your ads out about seven to eight days from your webinar and then gradually increasing with the highest spend between those, you know, the last three to four days before the webinar. Okay. So let's say that you have $1,000 to spend on your ads for your webinar. Mm -hmm. And, and let's say you're going to start seven days in advance. So you're saying that it's cool if you start out with, let's say $20 a day, and then you go $40 a day, and then you're kind of adding a little bit at a time until you're really ramping up at the end. Did I hear right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. And on those increases, when I'm increasing the individual ad set budget. So if I, if my budget is $10 per, for one ad set and I'm like, okay, I want to get more of that. I want to increase the budget on that. I'm not going to, I generally do about 50%. So I'll go from $10 to $15 instead of going $10 to say $30. That's a pretty big jump. And tell us and why I'll, again you would do that versus like 200% increase. Yeah, because it, because you're sort of flooding that Facebook algorithm and it kind of, you're bringing, you're, you're saying, okay, well, I'm running along here at $10 and my delivery is whatever it is, X, you know, XYZ. Well, if I all of a sudden I'm like, holy cow, this is such a good cost per lead. I want to spend more. Well, when you do that, it sort of floods that target audience that you are targeting and the algorithm, it's it's almost like it can't catch up in time. Gotcha. And so when that happens, your cost per lead oftentimes is going to go up. So one way to combat that is just to gradually increase that daily budget and go at like a 50% mark. So go from like 10 to 15, let that run for a couple of days, see how that does. And if you're still happy with that, jump it up you know, seven fifty or $8 after that. So you go from like $15 to $23 or something, or 20, maybe 25 and just okay. do it incrementally. Okay. That's great. I don't think I've ever heard anyone explain it like that. And it makes perfect sense. So Dana, hopefully, and others listening, you find that really valuable in terms of how to run your ads for your webinars, because inside my program, I talk about not running ads. Usually seven days is probably the most I'd start to run an ad but I love the idea of ramping up and then really putting some good money the last few days before a webinar. And the reason why Dana is bringing that up guys is because we've seen that the show up rate tends to be a lot stronger when people have just signed up for the webinar versus if they signed up 10 days ago, they might kind of lose the excitement for actually being there live. And we all know that you make more sales on a webinar if you can get people there live. So having them sign up just a few days before is always really valuable. So if you want to save your marketing dollars for that, you want to try this ramp up strategy that Rick's talking about. So question number four is from Lisa. And Lisa says, can you give me some insights into lookalike audiences? 
When should I be creating them to get the biggest bang for my buck? And when have you seen lookalike audiences not be really effective or have you seen them not be effective? Mm. Now, Rick, before you answer this, because you explain Facebook ad stuff much better than I do, will you tell people a little bit about what a lookalike audience is just in case we have some newbies listening in? Yeah. So a lookalike audience is basically when you take a custom audience, like you've uploaded your email list into Facebook, or you are building an audience of retargeting for your website or your Facebook fans. These are all people that Facebook knows about because Facebook is tracking these for you. So let's just take our email list, for example. If we upload our email list of a thousand people into Facebook, Facebook is going to match the email addresses that are on your list to Facebook users with the same email addresses. So you might match, I don't know, between 40 and 60%, let's just say. So let's keep it nice and even. We'll upload a list of 1,000 people and Facebook is matching 500 of those people. So because Facebook knows a lot about those users, because they're on your email list and those are their Facebook users, Facebook knows a lot about those people because of all the data it has about its users. And so you can create a lookalike audience out of those 500 people from your email list. And what that means is Facebook is going to build you a brand new audience of people with similar attributes as those people who are on your email list. And And it's really powerful. Like lookalike audiences for us work really well. How about for you? Yeah, they've gotten much, much better. And like one of Lisa's questions here is, have I ever not seen it work well? Early on when Facebook first came out with a lookalike audience, I didn't think that the matching, like the technology that they were using or the algorithm was very good. It has gotten better. And so I would say more recently, I've seen much better results. Great. So she's saying then, when should I be creating lookalike audiences to Mm -hmm. get the biggest bang for my buck? Yeah. Lookalike audience is a great way to scale. So if you're looking for, I always start with the warmest audiences when I'm targeting my ads, depending on what the offer is or what I'm trying to do. So I'll I'll target my email list, website visitors, my Facebook fans, and then I'll move to sort of the next temperature of traffic, if you will. It's not warm traffic, but it's not super cold traffic either, which is these lookalike audiences. Because these lookalike audiences are made up of people with similar attributes as the people who are on my email list or the people who are visiting my website or my Facebook fans. So I'll create them as soon as I have that original audience. So as soon as I've uploaded my email list, I'll create that lookalike audience right away for it. And then from there, use it as you scale your ads. So if you're looking for additional targeting opportunities, you can use lookalike audiences for that. One thing that a lot of people don't use lookalike audiences for, which I think is really, really, I don't think it's, I know it's really powerful, a couple different things. If you have, let's just say you have a segment of buyers. So if you have a, a, a list in your email program, whether it's AWeber or MailChimp or Infusionsoft or whatever it is, and these are just your buyers, you can upload that list. Now, granted, it does have to be several thousand people because you have to give Facebook enough data, if you will, to create a lookalike audience for you. But if you upload your list of buyers into Facebook and you create a lookalike audience out of that, Facebook is now going to find you other people on Facebook with similar attributes as your buyers. So that's really, really powerful to, to do. One of the other things you can create a lookalike audience out of is the people who are converting. Let's just say you're sending traffic to a webinar registration page and you are tracking through conversions the people who are registering. Well, you can create a lookalike audience out of those people who are opting in to register for your webinar. And that's that's really, really powerful because those people are registering and you want, you're like, okay, Facebook, I want more of these people. So create a lookalike audience out of that. So I would definitely be using lookalike audiences in your targeting. And the last thing, Amy, I'll say about this is that don't forget that you can also layer in, just because if you're using a lookalike audience in your targeting, you can also layer in interest targeting, meaning like another Facebook page. Good point. On top of that. Okay, talk a little bit about that and why that would be valuable. Yeah, because a lot of people don't really, you know, they're, they're, they think about it, they're like, oh, I'm just targeting my lookalike audience and that's all I can do. Well, one thing, if you want to narrow it down even more, because the lookalike audience size generally is pretty large. It starts off at around 1.8, 1.9, 2 million people, somewhere in that ballpark. And that's a pretty large audience to be targeting to. One way to narrow it down even further is to start layering in additional interest or Facebook pages that you can target. So maybe, you know, if I want to target, you know, create a lookalike audience and then layer in your name. So people who have an interest in Amy Porterfield, I can layer that in on top of the lookalike. So now what I'm telling Facebook is, 
I want to target people in this lookalike audience, but these people also need to have an interest in Amy Porterfield. So now we've just brought that 2 million people down to like 400,000 people. I mean, so that's you get good very, stuff. very specific. Yeah. So I remember when I was talking to James Wedmore, who of course is a mutual friend of ours, and he was bragging like a crazy guy about these amazing results he was getting with his targeting. And I remember it was the first time I heard someone say, look, I took this lookalike audience and then I layered it with a few different Facebook pages that I knew were really popular among my audience. And he said his targeting was on point more so than he's ever seen. And he was getting amazing results. So I know that this yeah. works. It definitely does. And what I love about, well, number one, I would test. So when you're testing this, test the lookalike audience straight up as it is first and see how that does. And then depending on how it does, then you can start layering in like we're talking about here and see how that does. One thing I don't understand why it works, but it does is even if I layer in, let's just say we're targeting people who have an interest in you on top of my lookalike audience. Well, if I also have a separate ad set that's just targeting people who have an interest in you, you would think that there's a lot of overlap there. Right. But it, it works. <laughs> I've never had that problem before. What? It works really, really well. And I, and I really don't have a, a rationale for it. Okay. But. So just to be clear, so everyone understands, you're running yeah. an ad and you have a lookalike audience and you put an extra layer and just using me as an example, you put an extra layer where they also are fans of my Facebook page. Yes. And then you're running another ad where you're just targeting fans of my Facebook page right. and both ads do well. Yep, exactly. I've tested this before. I have no idea why it does. I wish I could explain it, but I can't, but it has worked very well in the past. This is why I love doing Q and a with you because I always want to share like little nuggets that make absolutely no sense, but they're yep. working. And so yep. you wouldn't think to try it, but everybody can kind of try it on for size and see if it works for their audiences as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Good stuff. Okay. We aim to please, right, Rick? <laughs> All the time. All the time. Okay. So moving on to question number five, this is from Nick and it's so specific. And I think so many people are going to find this one helpful. So I can't wait to jump into it. This is what Nick says. I'm getting a 53 cent cost per lead, but not converting these leads into sales. I sell a $997 training course for my niche. What am I doing wrong? Well. <laughs> not doing anything wrong in getting those leads, it sounds like, because 53 cent leads is really, really good. Really good, um, right? I would take that all day long, for yeah. sure. So it doesn't sound like the issue is on the front end, meaning it sounds like he's doing really, really well for the Facebook ad, the conversion on the, the opt-in page and, and all that stuff because the, the, the leads are so low. Now, Grant, we don't really know what the conversion rate is in the landing page, but his cost per lead is very, very good. It sounds like it's a funnel thing, meaning... What does the follow-up look like, you know, in the email series? Because if he's selling a thousand dollar course, I'm guessing, and obviously we're taking, making some assumptions here, but I'm guessing he has, you know, a payment plan for that where he's getting such good cost per lead, but yet not converting on the back end. That would tell me that there's something wrong with the sales funnel after people have opted in. So once they become a lead, what does that look like? Like, what does that email follow-up series look like? And I think that's where the breakdown is because it doesn't sound like it's a it's a Facebook ad issue at all because he's getting that such a good cost per lead. So I would look at what is the email follow-up series, where am I sending people to? If he's able to track people along the way, like you know, open rates and click rates in those emails, that sort of thing, I would look at doing that. The best way to sort of diagnose issues with your sales funnel is to be able to track the metrics along the way. And so you know, one way to do that very simply is to look at, all right, what are my open rates on the email? So if my open rates are not very good, then maybe my subject line needs some improving. Well, maybe my open rates are good, but people are not clicking in the emails to the sales page or whatever. So that would tell me maybe there's something wrong with the content in the email. Or if people like people are opening and clicking on the emails, but they get to my sales page, and they're not converting. Well, maybe there's an issue with the sales page. So Making sure that you know your metrics along your sales funnel is what's going to allow you to kind of diagnose where those problems are and then make changes accordingly. Okay. So this question actually is perfect for how you and I both teach in terms of funnels. And mm -hmm. I think you totally would agree with me that the Facebook ad is just one piece of the puzzle. And so yeah. when you're getting 53 cent leads, you're doing great. But when you're not converting those leads to sales, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with your ad campaign. Correct. 
And I think that's really important for everyone to hear and really pay attention to because an ad is part of your bigger campaign. And like Rick was saying, the follow-up series is so very important. And sometimes with my students, what I've noticed, if they're not doing webinars, webinars is an entirely different beast where you get to sell a whole lot sooner because you delivered usually 45 minutes of free content. So you get to sell right away on the webinar and then you get to sell in the follow-up sequence. But what I've noticed with my students who don't use webinars and they're attracting leads and then they're selling through email marketing is a lot of the times they're selling too quickly, especially if it's a $997 program where there might need to be a little bit of nurture in between the new lead you just got and actually selling them into your program. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. This really comes down to, and I know it's tough because you you really want to get right to that sale, but this is where the sort of the patience and the testing comes into play. Meaning like, all right, well, maybe I'm not going to go right from, you know, even a lead to an email series into a 997 product. Maybe I go from lead into email series into a hundred dollar product or something like that. And then from that $100 product, I go into the nine. You know, it's just a matter of testing different things to see what works. But yeah, it's really that follow-up series is so critical because that's where, I know you talk about this a lot, Amy, is that the whole know, like, and trust factor. Yeah. Where somebody has to get to know you and be able to like you to take out their credit card and give you $1,000. And that's not going to happen right off a Facebook ad. You know, it reminds me of the episode I did number 100, where I talked about keeping your business horizontal and then going vertical. And -hmm. the whole idea of going horizontal with, let's say one program you have is that you do get to work through some of these things. Do you need to change your email autoresponder because you're selling too soon? Or do you need to look at the metrics and think what you can and find out what you need to tweak? And when you stay with one product longer, instead of switching up and going to something new right away, you get to work out all of these things. And then it finally does start to click and starts to work for you. So I think there's something to be said with not jumping off of one project into another project, especially if you're running Facebook ads, it takes some time to work it all out. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also this too, this, it kind of proves that there's no right or wrong when it comes to this. There's yes. no like cookie cutter, you know, we're going to do this, this, and this, and this works for everybody. And so I'm going to follow this. It's just a matter of testing different things to see what works for your audience and for the offer that you are presenting. Yep. I totally agree with that. Okay. So we have made our way to our final question, question number six. And this one, we have a little extra for you guys, because we talk about all these questions before we get on and start to record. So we know that we're ready for them. And I know Rick has a really cool extra support for this question. So Jennifer says, do you have any tips for writing irresistible ads? I don't feel like my ad copy is very compelling. And I see this Mm. a lot. I mean, I bet you do too, Rick, where my students will show me their ads and they work so hard and they're so focused on the technology, like the dashboard of the Facebook ads, because we all Mm -hmm. know the power editor could just about kill us sometimes. So they put so much energy and focus there that you look at the ad and you're like, whoa, that ad would never attract anybody. It's so boring. And it's, and it just happens to all of us for sure. So give us some tips about ad copy so that we can attract our ideal audience. Yeah. This is one of those things that people really tend to, you know what, I'll be honest, myself included overanalyze Yeah, because like, I don't have a, I don't come from a copywriting background. You know, I've been in online advertising for 16 years now. However, I don't have a traditional copywriting background. So, you know, I'm just like you where I'm just trying to figure out, okay, what's the best copy to attract my ideal audience for this? And one of the best things that you can do for this, and well, there's two things. Number one is we have to remember the type of platform that Facebook is. It's a casual platform. People are there to share with their friends and family updates and pictures and videos and so forth. So speak in your ad copy like that, like you were sitting down for coffee with your ideal audience and like, how would you speak to that person? How would you tell them about whatever you're offering in your ad and write like that? One of the other things that you can do, one of the best pieces of advice that I was given, and I, <laughs> I don't know why it took me so long to do this, but I did this for the first time last summer. So the summer of 2015, it took me a couple of years to do it, was I had conversations with my customers. I emailed them, I jumped on Skype with them for 15 minutes and I had a simple conversation with them And I asked them some questions and I I made sure I could record. I asked them to record it. And what that allowed me to do is I could take what they were saying. So words right out of my customer's mouths, I could use that type of language in my ad copy. So good. So good. Yeah. And I 
I, I remember getting out these calls and I was like, what did it take me so long <laughs> to do this? Because this is gold. Yeah. Just using words, you know, I, I remember one, th- just a side note here. I remember speaking to one of my customers and she said, you know, Rick, I was in a room with other people just like me. They were doing the, exactly what I did. And they said to me, they said, you know what? It never occurred to us that we didn't need to be a marketer in order to use Facebook ads because they were in sort of like a holistic kind of mm. healing kind of profession. And I heard that. I was like, like mind blown. I was like, holy cow, that's <laughs> such, no, that's such a great thing. Anyway, use the language that your customers are using in your ad copy and just keep it casual. That's one of the best tips that I could give to people that if you're able to have these conversations, if you don't have customers already, you know, speak to your target audience, just people who would be your ideal customer, have conversations with them, see what kind of words that they're using, phrases, you know, what their pain points are and so forth, and use that in your ad copy. That will make it a whole lot better. I think that is a perfect question to end with. So much good value. Now, Rick, you have a blog post all about this. I mean, it's a juicy blog post all about Facebook ads and copywriting. Where can people find out about that? Yeah, no, thank you. RickMulready.com forward slash copywriting. And the the blog post, it's totally free. It's just on the blog. It's how to write copy like the pros, 23 copywriting tips from today's experts. So what we did with this, we've had a lot of copywriters over on the art of paid traffic. So we compiled all of their tips into the best tips and we put them into one epic blog post here. And so you can just go through, it's, it's quite pretty long enough. It's like 3000 words and it's just resource after resource, like things to do before you start writing, writing email, copy, best practices, things not to do in your copy, insider tips, that sort of thing. So it's rickmulready.com forward slash copywriting. Perfect. I always say become a student of copywriting. Even if one day you're going to hire someone to write all your copy, we do really need to know how to talk to our ideal audience. And the better you get at writing copy, the easier all of this becomes. At least that's how I feel. Absolutely. Totally agree. All right. Well, Rick, thank you so very much for being with me on another Facebook FAQ. I really, truly appreciate it. I always look forward to these and I can't wait till you come back. Yeah. I love it. Thank you so much. This is so much fun. So this is a perfect place to wrap up. Rick, thank you so very much for being here yet again to dive into all things Facebook ads. And I cannot wait till you come back again in about six weeks and we'll have brand new questions for all of you so that we can really get into the details, the how to, the strategies behind Facebook advertising. Now, next week in episode number 111, I will have guest Kim Garst on the show to talk about all things Facebook live video. And really even beyond Facebook, we're just talking about live video in general, what's working, how it's working, how to do it, the strategies behind it. We're going deep into live video. I would love for you to be there. So I'll catch you next week. And thanks again for being here. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Online Marketing Made Easy podcast at www.amyporterfield.com.